So as a priest, we get to do, or I get to do, I used to get to do, uh, weddings. Uh, so weddings are very interesting from a priest's perspective as well. Um, I've done some weddings over in Italy where um, it, was like, it was like something out of a movie, really. Uh, we were in this, the reception was in this old castle kind of a thing on top of a hill looking down into a valley which used to belong to the owner of the castle and uh, they had a whole tuna fish which I'd never seen a whole tuna fish in my entire life but they're like, a, like, like the size, size of a dolphin right and you could just go up and just take the meat off and then they had a swordfish again about the size of a dolphin over there and all being kind of cooked on a, on a spit kind of a thing absolutely you know blowing curtainy things, you know, over your pergolas and all. Was, I mean, it was just really romantic. Uh, yeah. So anyway, we get to see lots of weddings, and, and it's, very, it's very interesting. It's very interesting, the whole, uh, the whole wedding thing, right? The whole wedding, all the wedding traditions. And there were, indeed, many wedding traditions uh, in a Jewish wedding that we don't have anymore. So at times, when there are references to marriage, wedding, bridegroom, brides, all this kind of stuff that we hear in the, in the Gospels, for most of it would have just gone over my head because we don't have these traditions, we don't do these things. So it's a bit, it's a bit, a bit foreign to us. And to be honest, maybe from a lad's perspective as well, uh, brides and bridegroom, I just, I just don't really care. I just, <laughs> like, you know, lads on their wedding day, they have to actually get up and shower. <laughs> you know, maybe a couple of days beforehand, you have to actually go to the rental shop and rent the suit. It's hard, you know, it's tough going, like... <laughs> And that's kind of it. Uh, so we, we don't, I mean, not, that, not to give away any secrets of Holy Family or anything, but there have been evenings when the girls have been gathered up on the couch, wrapped up in, in blankets, you know, with the stove on, looking at wedding dresses. <laughs> it's a thing, apparently. My goodness, I never knew people really did that. I don't know, okay. Whatever. So you're interested in weddings more, more than we are. So it's a, the kind of an image that uh, maybe lads find it a little more, little more difficult Find it, we have a little more difficulty in relating to it. So, okay. It's in our gospel, so let's, let's, let's dive into it. Two points I want to make. One, the whole bride-bridegroom relationship, and two, uh, the, the foolish and wise or sensible uh, bridesmaids who had the oil. So what's all that about? These two things we'll try and, we'll try and explain today. So, first and foremost, um, at a, in a Jewish wedding, Jews preferably married Jews, right, because they want to preserve their faith. So this, is, this was always a problem, if you think of Solomon back in the day. Uh, Jews marrying people who weren't Jews, they had a tendency to bring in other traditions, uh, other ideas, and other gods, right? So it became very problematic then when, it's, it's, it's kind of similar to our day, in that, you know, if you marry, if, if a Catholic girl marries a Muslim husband, what do we do with the kids? What faith do they have? I mean, it's not exactly straightforward. I mean, so what do we do? So it was, it was very much frowned upon to, to, to marry outside of, of uh, the Jewish community. So marriages were normally arranged, and uh, it was straightforward enough. If, if a lad was getting married, uh, a son was getting married, if a girl or a daughter was getting married, there was a dowry to be paid. So while that was being sorted out, uh, that period was called betrothal, right? So you were betrothed. At that point, you, you couldn't marry another person, but you could actually get divorced because the wedding hadn't happened yet. So their weddings had two stages, betrothal and the wedding ceremony. Okay, so they got to celebrate the thing twice. Uh, the, the wedding was obviously the more extravagant celebration, but so there were two stages. That's why also we hear uh, that Our Lady was betrothed to a man named Joseph, right? At that stage, you still lived at home. You still, so you lived with your parents, even though you were betrothed. In, that's what, so it kind of works like engagement for us. Um, obviously, after the wedding, then you went to live with your, your, your husband or wife or husband. The girl, the girl would move. So, okay. Now, a dowry was paid. A dowry was paid for, for daughters. Ordinarily, it wasn't the law, but ordinarily, the dowry w w would actually uh, have been given to the daughter, or at least a large portion of it. It wasn't required, but most fathers would have been considered harsh if they didn't. So whatever the dowry was paid was generally given to the, the daughter. Now, I was, just, I was reading through this just this morning, actually, just to, to as, as I say, often if we don't understand the Jewish customs, then we don't understand the meaning of the gospel. I was thinking, what, is that, what, is it, what has that got to do with me? Dowry and, you know, betrothal and so what? 
Uh, is it clicking together with anyone yet? What's our dowry? What has been paid for us? What price has been paid for each one of us? The Lord's own life. So the Lord is, is like, uh, you'd pardon the expression, it's biblical, but like the, the lover of my soul. You know what I mean? He's, he's the bridegroom of the church. So we're all members of the church. We're, we're, we're the, the mystical body of Christ here, but we're, we're the bridegroom. As a church, we're his bridegroom. And a dowry, a price has been paid for us. Right? And that isn't just, it's not a superficial gesture. Uh, what has been paid for us is, is Jesus Christ's own life so that we can get to heaven, so that we can, be, we, can, we can enter into this, if you will, marital covenant with God. You know, but what has been paid for us is, is, is Jesus' life. That's what has been given. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing idea, such a, an astounding idea. It's not just something as simple as whatever, you know, 10,000, 20,000 euro, whatever the equivalent was back in the day. Uh, what has been given for us, what we're worthy of, or what God has made us worthy of, is, uh, is his own life. So when we come together as a church, we come together as, as, as a body, we, we gather as his bridegroom. Uh, and it's, it, it's a beautiful reality. We, sorry, we gather as, his, uh, gather as his bride. It's a beautiful reality. Secondly, then, the, the oil having the oil, not having the oil, those who were foolish and those who were wise. Okay, uh, there are probably numerous ways of, of interpreting this, but the one that I quite like, uh, it's one that, that Father Paul, the founder of my community, would, would say, uh, is that oil, right, oil gives light. When it's burned, it gives light, it gives warmth, it also gives direction. You know, we can see where things are because of, 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 of a burning lamp. So what is that in, in our lives? Well, it's, it's love. It's love. Love is what warms. Love is what also gives us direction. It's, it motivates us. It motivates our actions. It should motivate our actions, at least. I do what I do because I love, because I want to serve, because my, my children need it, so I'll work hard because my kids need a roof over their heads and food in their bellies, so I'll, I'll, I'll work. Uh, they also need my time, so I'll renounce my hobbies because I want to spend time with them. I renounce myself. Uh, when I'm tired, I'll still get up and do what needs to be done because I'm their father. So lo love is what motivates us. Love is what, what brings us this life and joy. And, and of course, for us as, as, as Christians, we always, always, when we hear the word love, we always have to understand that as self-sacrificial. Because today the word love is just so used and abused and thrown in everywhere and anywhere. Um, it, it's, it's, it's loss, it's, it's deep meaning. And love for us as Christians means sacrifice yourself. That's what love means. It's not just a feeling or fluttering of butterflies and they last about two weeks or something. Uh, it's, it's about self-sacrifice, self-sacrifice. So self-sacrificial love, that's what, 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 what we're supposed to be carrying. It's, it's what's supposed to motivate us, illuminate us. Uh, now, that's not something that anyone else can give us, okay? The love that I'm supposed to produce, if you will, or do, no one can give to me. As in, no one can love in my place. No one can love in my stead. If I don't do it, it's not done. You know, I, I, I can't... People can... No, don't get me wrong now. People, obviously, by their example and by their love, can definitely encourage me to do the, to do the right thing, but bottom line, I have to do it. I have to choose. You know what I mean? Uh, like, if I'm in a good environment, that'll definitely be easier. You know, if I've seen a loving father or a loving mother, if, if, if I'm in a, a community where I'm loved and esteemed and, and elevated, def, definitely then it, it's going to be easier for me to love. But bottom line, I still have to do it. Right? So our lamps are running out. So go. You know, go, buy, trade, get it, do something to get that love back. You know what I mean? You have to go, you have to do something. But it's, it's, it's too little too late. You know, they, 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 had their, they had their time, they had plenty of time to arrange, to organize themselves, to get themselves together. Uh, but we have a limited time here on earth, all right? With, it's not infinite, it does run out. So when the time comes and our lives are over, that's it. That, that was our shot. 
that was our chance. It's not God being unmerciful or unfair. Our, our, our lifespan is what it is. Love while you're here. Because you won't be here forever. Do what you need to do. Change what you need to change. Convert where you need to convert. Root out the vice where it needs to be rooted out. Do it now. Because you will eventually have to go. And when, 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 it, when, when we've left here, I mean, there, there is purgatory, don't get me wrong. Uh, so there is a place, there is a, this gift of God's mercy where if we haven't learned love here and we want to learn it, we have that chance there. If we haven't learned love here and we don't want to learn, well, then that's, that's our choice made. Then we don't want heaven, we don't want God, that's called hell. So it's, 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 it's while it looks like a, I don't know, a lovely kind of fluffy gospel. It's, it's quite deep. Uh, there's a lot going on here. Okay, we've been, we've been bought by the precious blood of Jesus. And he's reminding us that our lives are short. And while we're here, we're called to give light, give love, to make the world like a, 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 a holy place, my home, a holy place, my bedroom, a holy place, a sanctuary, my house, the place I work, uh, our communities, to make them holy places, places of light and joy and love. And then I will go. I will not be here forever. So I have my chance. Don't waste it. Do it now. We have, like, they were waiting for who knows how long for the bridegroom. We will eventually meet that bridegroom. You know, we'll eventually meet him. When? I don't know. Tomorrow? Day after? Ten years' time? No idea. I'll eventually meet him. So at some point, ah, he's sure he's, he'll be another while, we'll see, sure I've loads of time yet. Do you, though? Do you? Do you? Are you sure of that? Statistically, chances are, maybe, yes, depending on your age, average lifespan in Ireland is 83, so, but what if you're wrong? And what if you leave it so late that you just kind of get used to living this life without God, without love, living this kind of selfish life? What happens if you get used to it and simply then don't want to change? Because uh, something I, I've, I've mentioned before, the older I get, the, the, the more I notice in myself, the, the harder it is to change. You know, I'm 41 now. And I think it was definitely easier when I entered seminary. I was 21 when I entered. It's definitely easier then to be formed. Once you hit 30, oh, sure, you kind of, do you know what I mean? Like, eh, I know how things go now. And I have my hobbies and habits and I have my rhythm, you know. Once you hit 40, it's <laughs> I, I can only imagine what I'll be like when I'm 50, stubborn out. Uh, so it's, it's definitely it's easier to change when we're young because we're not going to be here forever. So Lord, we ask you to grant us this oil of love. Lord, grant that we will never wait for next summer's pilgrimage or, or next retreat that we go to, but that we'll start today to fill our lives with love, which means sacrifice ourselves. That's what will prove our love. That's what will deepen our love. Sacrifice yourself. And of course, we do this following the example of Jesus, our bridegroom, who has sacrificed himself for love of us to make us worthy to be as a church, his bride. Amen.